Hey guys, what do you think of my new filming corner? For those of you who've been here for a long time, I used to have this really, really pretty uh, studio in my basement in our house. And um, this really reminds me of it. So I'm excited to have bright colors behind me again. So I went back and looked at my old videos and I realized with my spinning kits, the little um, drop spindle kits that I've never actually made a, <laughs> a video of how to use it. I thought that I had, but apparently I haven't. So I wanted to go through the kit and explain how it works and why I like them. So when I first started learning how to spin, I learned on a potato and a chopstick and since then I have used other spindles and now I use spinning wheels but they're amazing tools and I highly recommend that if you want to learn how to spin on a normal spinning wheel that you start on a drop spindle because by having to support the weight of that spindle you learn how to build a very strong yarn. When I put my kit together I wanted to make it as inexpensive as I possibly could and the first part of that is a little dog brush. Now, I did try to source and find um, dog brushes, <laughs> and I had a really hard time finding anything less than like six, seven, eight, nine, twelve dollars. And so, this one is not as sturdy as what you would get if you went into a pet store, but it's a fraction of the cost and it does an equally good job. Now, the reason you want this is that if you're going to take inexpensive fleece and you want to be able to spin it, um, I like to use raw locks because of the texture and mostly because of the price point. I really don't like to spend $12 an ounce on fiber. Whereas if I get a whole fleece and it's a nice fleece, I can make endless projects. I can make so many sweaters, hats, socks that it's just mind boggling. And you probably, for a really, really, really nice fleece, you'll probably spend $80. Um, so. The equipment for spinning can get very expensive, and when you're first learning, I do not believe that you need it all. If you've seen those double paddles, in fact, I could go get them. Do you want me to go get them? Anyway, you guys have probably seen them, the ones that, two paddles, and they go like this. Those cost somewhere between 50 and $75 for those, and um, if you want the combs, which look like Viking claws, I absolutely love them. Those are so much fun. Those are closer to like $150 to purchase. They're, they're pieces of art. They're amazing tools, but when you're first learning how to spin, you don't need them. Something like this will work just fine. So I'm gonna start off with some raw locks that I have. I got this from the spinning box, and I feel like the spinning box is overpriced. I, I do feel that way about it, but it, it's kind of a habit I can't seem to be able to break because it's so much fun to have somebody else put something together for you and just to see what colors and, and that kind of thing they'll use. So these are very short locks and I'm not a huge fan of them. Let's see what breed are they. They're the Chevy, uh, oh, I'm not even sure how to pronounce that. Caroli, Caroli, C-H-A-R-O-L-L-A-I-S. Caroli Sheep Society, I believe they're a, a meat breed which generally doesn't have nice fleece. So this is very, very short. You generally don't want to use fleece this short, um, in my opinion. And you want to have something with a tough texture to do this on. So you're going to lay it down and you're going to flick the tips. And what you're doing is you're opening up the locks. And again, this is so stinking short. Um, it's hard to do this with really, really short, really um, dense fiber. It's much easier to do this on longer locks, but you still need to do it, even if all you have is short. And you can see this one has, the tips are quite, um, not felted, but they're, you can tell which end is the tips. You're gonna turn it and hold those, and now do it to those. And you're, what this does is it pulls out your dirt, it pulls out your um, any vegetable matter and it opens up the tip so that it's easy to prep. And I would highly recommend if you're gonna process a raw fleece that you do this, even if you have the um, brushes, even if you have the brushes, cleaning it like that first makes a huge difference. So this, so this is a cleaning tool, cleaning and opening. So this looks a lot different than it did when I first started. So I include this so that you can open up your locks. And then this here is what you put in your compost. 
Um, so there's that. So there's the brush, and that's why that's in there. Now, the other things that I include in the kit is one um, pre-blended. It's a very small, let's see, how many ounces is it? It doesn't say. A lot of times I will send something in the kit that is from someone else. Why does it not say? This one's super cute. It has a little Alice in Wonderland picture on it, which is super cute. But I'm not sure how many ounces this in it is. It can't be very much. I think it's probably about two ounces. And what this is, is it's a bat. And generally, what will be written on it is the type of fiber. So this one is uh, Merino and Corydale. And it still doesn't tell me how many ounces it is. Usually it'll tell you. So I'll open this up and show you how much you get. So I send one of these. And you, you can open this up and spin off of it. It's actually a lot more fiber than you realize. Um, in, with one pound of fiber, you can make a very large man sweater, if that makes sense. So you kind of can understand that two ounces really does go a long way. And then I try to send, send something that's locks, some kind of raw, some kind of raw fleece. This one, uh, that I showed you before, it has raw in it as well as some commercial roving in it. It looks commercial because it doesn't have any vegetable matter. One of the best ways you can tell what's commercial and what is hand cleaned or, or most fiber is not used making brushes. They, they have a mechanized way of cleaning it and processing it. Commercial generally has, I've only I'm not sure I've ever seen roving with any kind of vegetable matter in it if it was commercially done. If it was done on a on a hand machine by a small company with a small herd of sheep, it will have some vegetable matter in it, but I like it a lot better usually because a lot of the crimp is left. One of the downsides of a, a smaller flock is that a lot of times it'll also have pilling in it. There'll be little round nubs in it that will you have to pick them out by hand as you spin. So the commercial roving is very clean, but it's also somewhat dead. It doesn't have the same crimp in it. It's been chemically altered a little bit by the chemicals they use to eat the vegetable matter out of it. So that's kind of the trade-off that you have, which is why if you can find really nice locks and you can prepare your own that's really, really clean, it's a big deal. And there are some shops on Etsy that have phenomenal raw fleeces that have been coated and um, Natalie from the Moss Day Farms is one of them, but a lot of hers, I guess I wouldn't say a lot of hers, she loves long locks, like the Teeswater and that kind of thing, the, the Wensleydale and the Mohair. She loves that, but she also has some Corydale mixes, I think, that are like butter. They're amazing. And she also goes to Europe and brings home huge quantities, actual ton, tonnage, ton weight worth of wool she brings home from across the sea. So she's an amazing source. Um, anyway, so I also include with that, I think this one's Corydale, if I remember right, um, roving. And you'll see it's very, very, very clean. It is commercial, but it's not as slick and temperamental as Merino can be. It's a little stiffer and it's still, still soft. It's just not gonna be as soft as Merino. So I include some of this too. Because what I'm aiming for is for you to get a good variety to try with different textures. And then the last thing that I want to include is some alpaca, just because I love spinning with alpaca. This, these are alpaca locks. You can see that they don't really look like locks on a sheep and they open up and they're like down or <laughs> they're just so beautiful. And I love spinning on them and they're super easy to card. These guys are so easy to card. Um, with, they are, however, not terribly strong and not terribly springy. They're soft, they're lofty, but they're not strong. And they're, um, if you, if you spin them too tight, sometimes they'll have guard hairs in them that'll poke out and prickle you. So I like to do these in a single ply around a core. So I like to core spin with these so that it stays open and lofty. And, and which means you don't ply it with another piece. You just make a thicker, bulkier single ply to knit with. And it just, it, it's luxurious. It's, nothing is softer, except for maybe Angora Rabbit, which I love Angora Rabbit, but my goodness, is it not that much fun to work with. So you can see I get excited when I talk about my uh, fiber. So that's that. And on to the spindle. So 
with this with the drop spindle I have three dowels and the reason for this is that you can sorry I'll stop flashing that in your eye is that you you spin on to two of them both going in the same direction and then you put these into your lazy Kate and you ply onto this one does that make sense so two for spinning and one for plying because if you have to wind everything in a ball in order to ply it you'll never do it it's just too time consuming it's a pain in the butt so this lovely little dilly bobber fits on all three of them and so when you're done spinning on one you just switch it to the next one so instead of having to own three very expensive spindles all you have is three dowels and this just pops on and off it's so easy so the reason i don't have a hook in any of these dowels is because the hooks are the most expensive part of everything else that i make the hooks are the most expensive part and at the same time i don't love them too very much one thing that i really like to do is i like to just loop it around the top and i am trying to keep the cost of these down so if you like the thought of a hook what you're going to do is you're going to take the tiniest drill bit you can find and you're going to drill three holes in the top one in each dowel and then you're going to take a hook and twist it in i'd have to increase this by five dollars because the hooks have to be super 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 tiny and a lot of times they don't like to stay in and so um i am working on my design the other thing is if you choose to make these yourself they have to be under 3 8 inch and it's very hard in diameter otherwise it won't spin right you don't want it at any bigger than 3 8 of an inch if you do you'll be really sad because it'll be really bulky and cumbersome and the grommets it was really hard to, <laughs> it was almost impossible to find these grommets i all the tests that i ran trying to find the right um diameter so that it would fit with the CDs, but would also be small enough in the middle that it would go around the correct size dowel. So yes, go ahead and make your own if that's what you want to do. But it is, I'm trying to remember if I can think of, um, I'd have to go back and look to see the company. I haven't ordered these in a while because I wasn't selling them while I was on the RV trip. But I'll try and find the place and the sizes so that if you guys are interested, you can make your own. But, um, but we do appreciate your support if you decide that you want to just get it from us. So you can make this into a top whirl or a bottom whirl depending on how you hold it on the dowel. Bottom whirl, top whirl. So this is a Lazy Kate. This is an old drop spindle that I totally beat up and I did not like it at all. So what you'll have is you'll have these and this is your Lazy Kate. These are hardware that's far enough off the ground so that um, no matter how wide your yarn comes down, it'll still be able to spin. And you want to use locking nuts, the, the locking nuts on the bottom, otherwise it'll kind of come undone over time. So once you have a big bulk of yarn here, maybe I should try and just go get one of my balls and see if I can explain to you how it works. Anyway, I'll try. So you put it in like this and like this and your yarn would sit here can you see that your yarn would sit here then you take these little yogurt containers yogurt lids and put it here oh hold still and put it here and what that does is that as you're applying it keeps the it keeps the dowel from coming undone and it makes it so that it can spin freely so this is what you use to ply with once you have a ball, a, a, a spun piece of yarn here and a spun piece of yarn on here. Where did my other lid go? Oh, it's over there. So. So then, sorry, it's hard to do this up here. Come on. There we go. Okay, so now everybody's happy. There's two, there's two spindles, each with yarn on them, and then they, they spin freely. You don't want the eyes to be so small that they can't spin freely. And it just sits on the ground, and that's how you use it. So now, 
I'm going to try and show you how you spin with one of these. And I'm going to start, I'm going to start with my alpaca. Sorry, I need to retrieve my seat a little bit. So with alpaca, I do really, really like to use a, um, I like to use a core. Hold on, let me find one of my other yarns. So this one is a very scratchy one. I don't even remember what this was. I think this was a Romney. It's so beautiful, but it's so scratchy. It's perfect for gloves. Not perfect for hats, not perfect for sweaters, unless you're gonna wear something else with it. So there is some yarn. I made this, I believe I made this on the Mach 3. And it is a sport weight. So what I need right now is I need a leader, which is the yarn that I attach my um, my new fiber too. So I'm going to make a nice long leader. And I swear, you do not you do not know how to knit well, in my opinion, if you can't use a drop spindle. I strongly, 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 strongly believe if you're not dedicated enough to learn how to do it with a drop spindle, um, you may be wasting your money. I think there's hordes of people out there that believe that they wanted to spin but they didn't take the time to learn how to do it really well so they assume they don't know how to do it right because it's not working well on their spinning wheel when what they really needed to do was get something super cheap and just make themselves practice now practicing for once a week is not nearly as good as practicing every minute for 20 hours 20 hours 20 minutes 20 minutes a day is fantastic if you only pick up and spin a couple hours a year, there's a reason why you're not improving. So I just tied that right there. And the way that this works is that you're gonna loop it like that. See that? You're gonna loop it like that. It's not really, it's not a slip knot or anything. It's just a loop. And here, I'll try it. I'll show you again. So. It's like a half hitch. Does that make sense? See how it hangs? Okay, so now I'm gonna back you up a little bit. Okay, so there's my leader attached. And the reason I like to do it without the hook is I feel like the hook makes it unbalanced. Um, so now I'm gonna take my piece of thread and I'm gonna tie it on. And a, a really, really thin um, thread weight piece of yarn works just as well and my, uh, my okay so my leader is a little bit long so I'm going to I'm going to pop this off and I'm going to wind it on just a bit so that I'm starting a little bit closer to the tip okay okay now, the most important part of spinning is actually how you prep your fiber. And if you have roving, you want to do it this way too. But what, what you're doing is you're opening it up so that it reminds you of a spider web. Now, if you're really good at spinning and you've been doing it a really long time, you don't necessarily have to do this, but it makes a huge difference in the way that your fiber is going to turn out because you won't have clumping. So see how long that is? So I'm going to wrap that around my arm so that it stays out of the way. Okay. And the reason I'm making this video is because people keep buying the kit and then I feel bad because I, I don't have a video up on how to use it. If you've already used a drop spindle, it's pretty self-explanatory, but if you haven't, and I would assume that most people buying it are beginners. So I put the loop of yarn over the back of my neck. Did you guys see that? The loop of yarn or string that I have needs to go over the back of my neck so it's out of your way. Then I'm gonna flick it. I'm gonna pull it open and let it travel. Oh, I just lost my light, sorry guys. We had a cloud go over. And I'm gonna open it up. Now because it is from a, um, it's a core and it's from um, locks, it's going to have a different texture than if I was using roving. You're going to see more slubs. You're going to see it. 
you're going to see the the string wrap around the fiber instead of the other way around okay and I'm going to loop so they have a little bit more fiber and I'm going to let it travel up okay then I'm going to pop it off and I'm going to twist it on okay I'm going to try and back up so you can see it a little better. Okay, so I'm going to put my loop back on. Okay, I'm going to double check that I'm spinning in the right direction because sometimes after you've been plying for a while or spinning for a while, you have a tendency to want to ply in that direction again. See, I just pulled some of my string off my neck. Okay, I'm going to flick it again. And I just found a piece of vegetable matter. So I want to stop and pull that out. And again, I have made finished products with this. I have indeed. And um, I've made sweaters for my kids and yarn for socks with this. And it can be really fun. And I, I, it's never going to be as fast as a production wheel but if if what you really just need is something fun to do a fun process see i just pulled my string back over my shoulder and yes it is wobbling i'm not spinning it very fast if i were to spin it faster it would go faster but the thing is is i'm using i'm using a very th i'm making a very thin yarn on a somewhat heavy um on a somewhat heavy drop spindle now there are spindles out there that will do really lightweight and they are drop spindles or you can get one that is a supported spindle and you're going to spend anywhere from 25 to I don't know hundreds of dollars on them depending on how ornate they are so um, I don't care that this bobbles and wobbles I, I actually like this spindle just because I love not having to mess around with it later when I'm plying. And so there we have it. That's what it looks like. And I'm not, I, I should probably show you some of my other spindles, shouldn't I? I have spent a lot of money on some very expensive spindles just because I wanted to try them out. But I wanted to show you how to do a core spin because what's nice is that on, on this delicate fiber, I could make a yarn on this that was made out of alpaca and didn't have a core, but the likelihood of it breaking would be much higher because um, the, of the weight of the spindle and it would be very, very kinky because it would have too much twist in order to, it would have a lot of twist in order to be able to make it so that it would, could hold the weight. If you're going to make a really, really fine yarn you have to put a lot of twist into it if you're using a very delicate fiber and then it kind of defeats the purpose because then it's kinky and kind of rigid rather than soft and open so if you wanted to do something that was more soft and open um, I and you want to use a really delicate fiber and you don't want to use a coarse spun then I would recommend getting a supported spindle and there, again, there's some really beautiful ones out there. In fact, I should show you. Maybe in the next video I'll show you. But anyway, so I'm going to take my thread off from around my neck. You do want to do that if you're going to do a coarse bun. But there's the, the yarn so far. And for the first several years that I spun, I used a drop spindle. So, and that's also why I don't put the hook in it. I really don't mind just putting the loop back over it and going again. I feel like the hook kind of messes things up. So, I will try to make some more in-depth videos about that, but I wanted to just kind of get you guys started. My favorite book, oh, what is the name? Is it In Defense of the Spindle? I think that might be what it's called. Um, she does a really amazing book about spindles, and she taught me how to, how to make them do what I wanted them to do. But um, if, if this was ready, if this full bobbin was ready, I would now... This would be when I would pop the um, this would be when I would pop the actual whirl off and it is quite snug. You want it to be quite snug. So yes, it's hard for me to get off. And this would be 
when I would pop it into this. And I could offer these the, the hardware and everything on my Etsy store, but it would be so expensive. Just the hardware itself, just the metal costs $10. Um, and so if I was to sell a kit like this and I included wood, it would cost you like $50 because just shipping alone, this is a heavy piece of wood. So I could try selling it as a kit with just these parts with a diagram that explains how to do it. If you guys are interested in that, you're welcome to ask me and maybe I'll put that up. Um, I'm not sure how much I could sell it for. Probably, I could probably sell it for 17, but I, I don't know if that's worth it to you guys. A diagram of how to put it together and the hardware, the hardware is $10. So I could probably do it for 17, um, but it might be worth it to you just to go and, and experiment with it and make it yourself. I don't know, but that's how you do it. And um, there we go. And hopefully that answered some questions for you guys. It's really hard to teach through a video how to, how to spin necessarily. Um, it's much easier to just get it and start playing with it, reading books, looking at diagrams. Um, but I would say that if you're a beginning knitter or a beginning spinner, do a core spun because it gives you integrity in your yarn um, when you're just getting used to the actual spinning process. So all of that is on my Etsy store. Maybe I'll work on some plans to see if I can get together um, how you can make your own. I think it would just be more worth your time just to go make your own as far as the Lazy K goes. It's not a beautiful Lazy K, but it works really, really well. So maybe that's what I'll do is go see if I can get um, some plans made up on how to, how to put it together and make that available. The bad thing is, is now I get to try and clean up this mess. I'm just a little bit tired. Hopefully I can have it clean before the girls get home. It could just be that the chair is too comfy. There is, there is that downside to living in a dollhouse is that you can put whimsical furniture in that's so fun to play in that you just, you just never want to get out. It just makes you super, super lazy. I guess, I don't know, maybe that's it. Who gets to live with a hammock in their little tiny house? Me. But I'm not sure it's the most productive of furniture. 